for the for our editorial meeting here. Um, we've got a great speaker, uh, Nancy Wolf, who's going to talk about uh, digital imaging rights. Uh, but as as we usually do, we're going to start with with uh, update on the Neil Awards, and we we have Allison Bostrom. She's new to Connective, but uh, not to SIIA. She's She's been, how long you've been with us, Allison? Um, almost four years. Wow, okay. So, <laughs> so it's really great. I, I, I think uh, Allison's going to do a great job with, with the Neils. Um, so, Allison, you want to run through a couple things here? Sure. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, so, mm -hmm. on the first slide, um, if you want to click through, goes to uh, or talks to the meals prospect list that we created, um, and it just shows the performance so far. And this is in the last 30 days, how it's performing. People who have opened, clicked, or visited our website. Um, and then I just included a couple high-level marketing ideas that we're doing. Um, showcase your best work, how a meal award shapes your career. And then we wanted to do some video interviews, but I think we may have to push that to next year's plan um, just due to lack of time. And this is uh, Mike Marchesano with Connected. So uh, welcome to everyone on the call. I just want to add the um, first. I'm delighted to have Allison uh, on the team, as uh, as Ron said. She'll bring a lot of great energy and uh, discipline to the process. So we're excited by that. But to go to the um, the expanded list uh, that um, she referenced. Uh, the Neil Committee uh, over the summer uh, discussed the possibility of adding, um, you know, more muscle to the marketing process. So, as a result of that suggestion, which we agreed to, agreed to um, we went through the membership, particularly um, the editorial side of our member companies, to look for other editorial titles and functions that weren't part of our normal database. And as a result of that, we added probably north of a thousand names to the mix. So. We're looking at that new addition to our marketing program and, and tracking it closely to look for opportunities not only for uh, entries and participation but also for judges. So it's a, it's a new exercise, but uh, with uh, Allison's uh, eye on it, uh, we think it can be uh, helpful in, in both of those areas in the, in the form of new entries or companies that maybe had not participated in the past as well as uh, solicitation for judges. Yeah. And then if anyone has any suggestions on marketing or things that, you know, you would want us to try, feel free to email me still. Um, so the next slide, uh, we're going to move to a new venue. Um, it's 10 on the park, so I included just a screenshot of the inside and then also where it's located. And it's a, and it's a much uh, easier and central location for everyone uh, than had been at Pier 60. We've enjoyed Pier 60. It's a great venue once you get there. But there, you know, there, <clears throat> for those of you that have attended in the past, you now it's a little bit of a challenge to get there. And if the weather isn't cooperating, that just adds another dimension to the travel. So um, 10 on the Park is uh, you know, easy transportation access. Subway access is easy. And we just think it, it's a nice new uh, venue. And uh, we're excited about being there in uh, 2018. Okay, uh, the next slide is just the awards timeline so that everyone has the date. Um, and if you have any questions, just reach out. Um, the next slide, Ron, is the current list of judges. This was pulled, I think, on Monday when I created the slide. So we have a few additions because I sent out a call for judges this morning. And then the last slide is the pacing chart, so where we stand um, compared to where we stand now compared to this time last year. Which is showing uh, a little bit better performance, but we want to keep that going and uh, certainly see us uh, exceeding uh, the uh, level of participation from last year. So we're, as you can sense, watching it, uh, watching it very carefully. Allison, do you want to reiterate uh, what you need most from this committee? Um, I think that the I, I well, I've heard the judging aspect, and 
you know, your, your guys' recommendations um, on people you may know that can help us out, especially, you know, obviously first round judging, um, they don't have to be a member. So, and then any help with promotion, you know, if you have like a newsletter that you guys send out, we have graphics that I can give you, um, I can create copy for you, um, so you could include maybe in newsletters or things like that, or on your social media. Or any other thoughts or comments about uh, Allison's report? Okay. Are any questions on the judging? I've no. I know we've had some in the past about the different rounds. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. John, it's John. Can I just ask? Um, is it, would there be uh, any kind of use to uh, Allison sort of sharing this with uh, um, us uh, over the next couple of weeks to maybe kind of help to um, you know, move the dial a little bit um, locally uh, just by having this this data? So, uh, John, are you looking for the? the uh, the pacing report. Uh, the, pa the pacing report, particularly. Uh, yeah. I, th I think uh, the judges, the judges' report and the pa pacing's report okay. would be, I think, helpful. Sure, glad to. Glad to come okay. Also, what is the time frame of the uh, judging? This is Christine. It's uh, my first year. So, uh, and and what is the time commitment for the uh, the first year judges? Um, so maybe some people on this phone will know better, but uh, when I spoke to Erica Taylor, who wasn't able to join us today, she mentioned that it's about six to ten hours for the first round screeners. Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, a lot depends obviously on the number of judges that we have and the number of entries. So the ratio, we try and keep the ratio of um, number of uh, sort of assignments for each judging round to a manageable level, and, and sort of that's the goal, as Erica had Erica Taylor had suggested to Allison, you know, we'd like to keep it within that time range um, mm -hmm. for for you know each one to make it as manageable as possible. Great. And when are when are the categories closed and most of the judging done? Like when when would that uh, time be needed in action? Um, first round screening uh, starts January 9th through the 26th. Mm -hmm. So we give you a block of time to try and get it you know get it done. So it's a uh, not obviously a burden on your day job, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you know allows us time to to do the the proper level of, of screening. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I say thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, thanks, everyone, for their continued support. We appreciate it. And you know, obviously, I think for all of you on the editorial committee and the Niels committee, you recognize as we recognize, this is probably the most important initiative for Connective in our industry each year. I mean, it really puts a spotlight on the great work that uh, individual member companies do uh, in communicating to their audiences and markets, and it puts a spotlight on the terrific work that B2B uh, media does in educating and informing on key issues in you know, over 100 different market sectors. So uh, we've been Proud to do this since 1955, and uh, you know it will continue to be um, the most important part of uh, of Connective's uh, member member services. All right, and 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 I'll forward uh, inform information how to reach Allison and uh, and other things so we keep you in the loop constantly. What's happening, as John as John suggested? Thanks, Ron. All right, uh, we'll move on to our main part here. Uh, when, when John McManus and I spoke about a month ago uh, about topics for this, I, I think digital imaging rights uh, came up pretty quickly. And, uh, and, and John talked a little to me about, about what was happening in his, his shop. Uh, and I was fortunate to that we have Chris Moore, uh, who's SIIA's VP of Intellectual Property and General Counsel here uh, to contribute, and and then it, uh, he knew Nancy Wolf, um, 
a partner in a law firm in, in New York who's given this presentation before and, and has uh, loads of experience in this area. So I, I think we're going to start with, with John uh, just to give a little setup here, and then we'll move, move to, to Chris to, to introduce Nancy, get a little bit of everyone. Uh, John? Yeah, thank you, Ron. And I, I just want to say thank you, Ron, again, because um, it's been, you, you're, you're such a great partner. We, we have these conversations a few weeks ago, and then invariably you, you, you sort of drive really good, um, uh, very helpful uh, content and people and um, really good conversations. So thanks for doing that. Um, this, is, this is an issue that, um, you know, at Hanley Wood is, uh, is a, Today issue. It's it's um, uh, we have uh, gone through a stage of um, trying to focus on um, volume of uh, content and um, in the uh, in the frenzy of trying to drive uh, a, a lot of volume, uh, we've gotten a, a little bit undisciplined in terms of the uh, uh, migration of, of content that um, is not always uh, kosher. Um, to into our sites and we're paying a price for it uh, so it's a pain point and um, so I th hope that uh, Nancy's comments will um, be helpful um, maybe not only looking at um, the sort of current uh, guidance on um, you know how, how to go forward but also possibly to um, uh, comment on um, you know the, the pot potential risk for uh, content that's uh, legacy in, in, in our sites already. So uh, really appreciate uh, this being a topic. All right, and uh, we have Chris Moore here. Uh, I also just want to say if, if any questions arise during the presentation, please uh, eat, ask them then or we'll also have a little time at the end. Uh, Chris? Sure. Hi. It, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Nancy. When Ron told me uh, that you all were interested in uh, learning how to do this the, the right way uh, and were concerned about how quickly things were changing, uh, she was the first person, frankly, that left to mind. We have worked together in the past on uh, in, in my past life where I represented content owners, among them um, the photography industry. Uh, Nancy represents uh, traditional and digital media entities and specializes in uh, essentially making sure you never see need to see a courtroom. So it's licensing and uh, counseling and releases and, and things like that. Um, she is a partner at uh, Cowan Debates Abrahams at Shepherd in New York and um, I look forward I'm looking forward very much uh, to this presentation so Nancy it's, it's all yours okay well thank you very much for introducing me it's a pleasure to uh, speak to all of you while I can't see anyone um, I put together slides, probably way too many, and we're going to I generally move through them quickly. Uh, and, and the focus is trying to bring attention to the areas where I've seen so many problems lately and sort of uh, where to go for trusted images where you're not going to get a claim. And, I see it from both sides. I represent a trade association of all the sort of large and smaller image licensors, um, you know, whether, you know, the, the Gettys and the Adobe's and the Shutterstock as well as smaller specialty libraries, individual photographers, but also publishers. So I have been dealing with claims from, you know, small blogs who um, thought they understood the rules of the road the way smaller publishers do and they have found themselves in trouble. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, so I've been giving a lot of advice on this, this lately. And uh, the problem is, and this slide kind of tells it all, it's so easy to just what I call just right click and grab an image. People are Instagramming, everyone's sharing. So particularly when you have young, uh, young college graduates helping put stories together and sourcing images, 
the, the rules of the road are very different than the way they used to be. It used to be very easy. You went to an image library, you went to a photographer, you got a license. But now it is so easy to Google an image, find something on Pinterest, um, or you know, grab an image from Twitter. And uh, it's very hard to resist those images for a lot of people because it's fast, it's easy, it's immediate. But there are a lot of good reasons, and I'll go through them when we get there, why there is risk involved. One, you know, you're obviously not getting a license from either the, the copyright owner or someone's authorized. Um, you're not getting any indemnification if, you know, something goes wrong, there's a bad release, the, way the person isn't who they say they are. Um, and sometimes you need third-party clearances with different types of uses depending on the content. And you'll never be sure you have any of those. Um, and I think this is really coming to a head because at one time, I think it was the risk of using an image here and there was very low, um, very expensive to bring a copyright infringement case. It was sort of understood very few photographers ever registered, which is the key to the courthouse. But that is changing. Um, there, there are litigation practices now that are there to follow um, videos and images that go viral these practices will contact the content owner. They will say, we will register it for you. It will be registered within three months of publication, and we can go after everyone for statutory damages. And they don't care if some recoveries are 750 and some are 10,000. It is high volume. And there are photographers who have lost a lot of income because the value of licensing has gone down that have just turned into sort of a enforcement practice as, as a way of making a living. And I am seeing this over and over. And, in, and it's you know, affecting even um, my clients that are in the, the traditional image libraries. I spoke to a paralegal at one of them, and her words to me were, winter is coming. Um, and sometimes the copyright bar here in New York, we always laugh. There's a lawyer in New York who has filed hundreds and hundreds of cases. And we're like, maybe we should send him a gift back because he's keeping us all in business. But it's really unfortunate because once he finds a publisher that has problems with images online, they keep going after him. And I have a client who tried to even clean up all the back stuff from four, five, six years ago when they thought if you directed images to another blog, you were helping them out and it was fine and that was you know, part of the, the way the Internet worked took off all his images, all the old images, got them down, whether they're licensed or not, just couldn't take it anymore. And they went into internetarchive.org with this image recognition technology and found images that probably no one saw in seven years that were looked at three times. But there's, they were there. Um, so um, I don't mean to scare everyone, but this is starting to happen. So I want to talk about how we can avoid this. Um, what we found in a recent litigation was it was very helpful to the judge in keeping damages awards low that we had come up with a written image use policy for this company and that they had started getting subscription licenses and they had something in writing, a little bit more training. Um, and there were specific things and that, that was helpful. Um, if you get a claim, just pull the image right away and just to investigate it. Get it off so you, you, you cut the, the harm. Um, and sometimes you have to determine whether the image was really licensed because these companies are really do mass production and image recognition technology. It will pull up where an image has appeared somewhere on a website, but it won't tell you if it's licensed. And they make mistakes. It may be part of a, a subscription that you have. So you, you really do need to investigate it. And if something comes up, I would immediately just try to settle it right away and offer a multiple of a standard license fee. Now, I, I would think starting something like three times and just try to get rid of it because the litigation costs will rise and that's what every, the, the uh, attorneys that run these high volume practice count on, that the cost of litigation will always give them a lot more value than uh, what they get. And, and what happens now, you won't even get a letter, you will just get a lawsuit because they found that that's a better business model. So the way to avoid that is to really rely on trusted sources when you, you know, source your images. 
Um, and then if you do find an image that you find from sort of more of the outlier type of source, there is information on Instagram. You can contact by hashtag and try to at least go back to the source and, and try to determine if that person really is the owner and get permission. So next slide. Um, some red flags. There are a lot of sites that are called free images, but when you look at them, they will have watermarks from companies that license images. Um, the problem with the internet is that anyone can upload other people's content and you don't know. So if your, your photo department or your creative department comes up with like, I have a really great way to save money, remember nothing is ever really free. Um, all right, the other issue is I think the word public domain is thrown around all the time. And I think there's a, a lay person thinking that somehow the internet is free because it's public and that's in the public domain. But um, I'm sure many of you on this call are probably copyright lawyers and, and know much better that you know in the US it's a little bit tricky um, because we had uh, two acts and in 78 uh, the act radically changed and um, a lot of works under the former Copyright Act where there were a lot of formalities fell into the public domain, but it's very hard to research it. So if you want to be 100% confident, you know, you could look at works published before 1923. And that means they were published with notice and registered and everything was done right. U.S. government works are in the public domain. Um, but that doesn't mean you might not need model releases or other types of releases. Um, a lot of clients have had problems using NASA pictures where the astronaut will say they're recognizable and you didn't get permission from them. Um, somehow the position that they're in on the moon or flying through space uh, is so recognizable that the fact you can't see them through their helmet doesn't matter. Um, and then there's a lot of works that are not in copyright. The other um, license that's very popular but sometimes can trip you up are the Creative Commons licenses because there's so many varieties of them. And some of them, you will not have an effective license if you haven't given the proper attribution. Or some will say non-commercial. And what does it mean? Is your use commercial or not? Well, Creative Commons spent a million dollars doing a study on what was commercial or non-commercial and it came up inconclusive to them. So it, not, you have no one to call and ask a question, whereas if you went to um, you know, a traditional image company, you would be able to get an answer to that usually. Some won't let you make derivative works and others are share alike. Creative Commons Zero is really someone dedicating the work to the public domain. But the other issue here too is there's no person behind these tags and you don't know if someone has put a Creative Commons zero on a work they don't own. Um, so again, you, you really don't have something you can rely on if something goes wrong. Um, you're not going to get, you might get a copyright license, um, but you will not get a release if there's a recognizable person. If something goes wrong, no one's going to stand up behind it. And it, you, you really, don't know whether it's reliable or not. And I'm sure if you, if you go to you know, scientific and scholarly journals and a professor is putting a CC0 on, you can feel confident. But I think if you go to some kind of image site where there's a lot of, of Creative Commons licenses, you might want to do a little more investigation. Next slide. Um, and this is just an example where uh, an, an ad was done using a Flickr photo but of course, there were pictures of a family on vacation and there was no license. And it's Murphy's Law. Even though I think they might have been from New Zealand, they happened to be in America and happened to see their family on a billboard. So you might think that randomly taking one picture off the internet, you'll never get caught and you never know what can happen. Next slide. Um, so when you look at images, um, you might be able to say, well, the copyright is fine, but are there any other permissions I might need for the type of use that I'm contemplating with it? And here, everything uh, really depends on the context. Uh, 
of how an image is used. Is it used as an expressive work? Is it newsworthy? Or is it trying to promote goods and services? So you look at there's people in an image where you might have publicity or privacy rights. Is there any very recognizable places where you might have some trademarks or other types of rights? Or is there some object in the photograph that could have copyright or independent trademark rights? And next slide. Um, so I'm going to do a quick, very quick view of just copyright. And you have to remember that so much online publishing really is worldwide, but there is no you know, international copyright or worldwide uh, laws. Um, so I'm going to focus on the US, but just always want to remind everyone that things can be different in different countries. And there are always, uh, even though there may be treaties where everyone agrees to the same general principles, there could be subtle differences between term of copyright and whether you know, buildings, outdoor buildings can be used for some countries and not in others, and that nothing is exactly uniform. Next slide. Um, and just to remind everyone that, uh, that almost every image that you find online will probably be protected by copyright. It just needs to be original, and it needs to be fixed, and it needs to be one of these categories of works. And of course, photographs and videos fit under pictorial works or motion picture and audiovisual works. So next slide. Um, and saying that almost every photograph will be original enough. Even you know a photograph of a blue sky vodka bottle was considered original enough, uh, a very thin copyright. More than one photographer can take the same, take a similar photograph of a sky vodka, but just because it's a very simple photo doesn't mean you can use it because it's not protectable. It's, its originality is very low. Um, as everyone knows now, you need to be a human. Um, and the, the poor monkey who took this picture doesn't seem to have a, a copyright. Uh, can't go through one of these things without my monkey selfie. But uh, this will be interesting coming up soon when there is much more artificial intelligence and you know software created to create work. So we're going to have to figure this one out. Next slide. Um, the other issue I get is, a lot of people love using outdoor pictures of urban areas that have graffiti and murals and artwork. And there's this perception because somehow they may be done because it's on a building and maybe it would be considered vandalism and it's not hanging in a museum that somehow copyright doesn't cover it. Um, or that if you are a graffiti artist, you don't want anyone to know who you are. I am getting claim after claim from graffiti artists because they've figured out that people will license their work. They're being, their work's being shown in galleries now. And, and again, yes, being licensed from clothing. And they are now showing up to court, contacting image libraries, and making claims that images have been used for commercial purposes without their consent. So the world's changing. An example of this was Anna Sagasti who actually, if you knew him by his street name, was a hole sniffs glue, was not too embarrassed to come to court and sue Eagle Outfitters for taking his droopy eyes, which are in Miami, and creating an advertising campaign out of it. Um, this case obviously uh, settled. But um, so the presumption that just because something's on a wall doesn't mean that uh, no one's going to care or no one's going to bring a claim. Um, and the same with tattoos. Uh, this tattoo uh, artist uh, who created the Michael Tyson tattoo uh, was able to bring a claim when a very identical tattoo was used in a movie. So the fact that it was on a face, one of the arguments was, well, it's not a work of art under the copyright act because it's on skin, and, and that did not prevail. I mean, it's, it's still a visual work of art, and nothing says it has to be on canvas. So next slide. Um, and then just to remind everyone that the, the exclusive rights that are generally uh, involved with, with works of art are with visual art, reproduction, derivative works, distribution, and public display. Um, next slide. Um, so a derivative work is the one that trips a lot of people up. Because I think there's this idea, well, if I just change an image 10%, or if I make or if I like reshoot it and I 
you know, I changed the identity slightly, um, that I've created a new work. But it's very tricky because a derivative work is an exclusive right you have under copyright. And where the line is between, you know, transforming a work or recasting it and creating a new work can be very difficult and when something is fair use. And I find that this is an area that uh, trips people up. Um, and you can if you really like an image, but you want, for example, it would look better if uh, instead of having someone of one race, if someone was a different race for whatever campaign you're doing, you can always do a license for a derivative work. And then the other, my other favorite thing is particularly from the documentary film lawyers in my office who like me to do fair use reviews, their clients seem to never want to license anything. And the word I get, well, can't I just fair use it? Which it's really not a verb. You really do need to look at the context each time you want to rely on fair use instead of getting permission. So um, I sort of have fun with that. And, um, you know, we have to remind some people who want to sort of default to fair use that it really still is an exception. And while it, it's been expanding by the courts over the years, it, it still is something that is not black and white and you need to make a judgment call. Um, and, you know, it, it's very um, easy for someone to think, well, what I'm doing is news reporting, so it must be fair use. But it, it, but it is more complicated than that. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, it's very fact in intensive. Um, you have to look at the factors. Some of the factors, you know, are more important in visual arts than others, and then just look at case law. So if you want to do that, I would say when you're doing your guidelines for, for use of images, that you would have someone that if you want to rely on fair use, you'd have to go to counsel within your office to get it approved. Um, and it, it isn't just done at a very low level because you really do need to look each time. So next slide. Um, and I guess we're always forced to go through our factors, but this first factor has really become the dominant factor. Um, at one time, if your use was commercial, it always was considered that it would be unlikely to be fair use. That's no longer sort of the, the trigger. Um, but if you go to the next slide, this, this concept of whether something's transformative has really taken over the dialogue in determining whether something is fair use or not. And uh, you really do need to look at whether the second use supplants the original or adds something new. So if you're just using an image to enhance a story just like the original would, then it probably would not be transformative. If you are commenting and um, really critiquing that image itself and why it's so newsworthy, that would be a different exception. So this is really the question that is one that has to be answered because the rest of the factors fall depending on how you come out on the transformative use issue. Um, and I think with visual art, there's a lot more leeway with appropriation artists than if you're just using works in publications. Um, the second factor is pretty neutral, um, whether something's factual or highly creative. You know, some images are very factual, they just document something, and others are very highly creative, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. The next slide. Um, how much you take. This also, you know, if you're looking at how many lines in a book, it could be very relevant, but typically with a photograph, the courts have allowed when something is considered fair use to take the whole thing, because it's very hard to um, take just a portion of a photograph, because you're not getting the entire message. Uh, so it's not too relevant. And uh, the fourth factor is still relevant, um, sort of the effect of the use on the potential market. Um, if, if you're using it in a way that would traditionally be a licensed work, you, you may have less of a fair use argument, um, but it isn't as uh, black and white. The fact that you've asked for a license and have been rejected wouldn't necessarily mean it wouldn't be fair use, particularly with parody, because with parody, no one really wants to give you permission to make fun of their work. So the next slide. 
Um, and these are, this is an example of a publisher who uh, was effective in succeeding in fair use with using full images, where it was a book on the history of the Grateful Dead, and these smaller images were part of a thumb line with lots of other context. And so they were used as a historical context, and they weren't used for the sort of the aesthetic value. Um, and uh, this is probably one of the first cases where uh, it would, it, they looked at images as using them not for sort of the visual enhance, uh, enhancement, and no one altered the image, no one transformed the image. They are the same as they would be, but it was the context that gave it fair use, uh, which has been very helpful to a lot of documentary filmmakers, uh, but has made some of these questions a little trickier. So next slide. Um, so here is an example where a photograph had been actually, and I don't, I'm not even sure this is the photograph, but this is a case where when the photograph is the story itself, then you have a much better fair use, um, either defense or right, as different people want to call it, because this was a story about a woman who won Miss Puerto Rico, and then also was found to have posed nude. So I think this is a placeover picture, since probably they didn't republish the nude pictures. But it's the fact that she actually did these pictures that was considered the news. And so when uh, the photographer sued about the publication, the court said that it was fair use because it, essentially the pictures were the news and they were being used for a different purpose. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you can see an example where a photograph was considered infringing by, a pu by the publisher's use and not newsworthy. And this is the case where the actress had secretly married her agent and not told anyone for certain years. The chauffeur found a stick with images and sold them to the publication. And so there were many pictures splashed on many pages, which of course drove people to purchase the magazine. And you could have told the story about their secret marriage without having five or six or seven images. Now, the question was if they maybe had one small image, what would have happened? But, but this was uh, clearly the court thought that you were using the image for the same purpose that, the, that they were taken for, which was as the photograph itself. And it was just enhancing the story. And so that was an infringement. The next slide. Um, and then when you get to social media, uh, things are even trickier. So um, the, the photograph of raising the flag at 9-11 is owned by North Jersey Media Group, which was uh, the newspaper company, um, and I forgot which newspaper in Northern Jersey. Um, but they have been bringing many, many claims about the use of this picture. In this case, it was used by Fox, and it was on 9-11, and it was on the, the I think, oh, Instagram was social media. So it might have been both Facebook as well as Instagram. And they compared it to the other famous photograph um, with the flag, and they put hashtag never forget. So on a motion for summary judgment, Fox argued that this was fair use because they were commenting with the hashtag never forget and putting the two photos compared which were often compared together. And the court said that there were too many questions of fact and it could not be decided on summary judgment. And literally on the eve of trial, the case settled, so we won't know. Uh, but that just shows how uh, on social media, you still have to be careful how images are used. And I think people have this assumption that social media is where images are supposed to be shared. But if you're sharing images that are licensed frequently and the owner's police, you can still have problems. Next slide. Um, I get a lot of questions about when releases are necessary. I don't know if we'll have time to get through all this. I do have some free um, videos on the Digital Media Licensing Association website about when releases are needed and some things on fair use, so we'll see as much as I get through. But I get this question all the time is like, when do you need a property release? When do you need uh, a model release? Um, and you know, generally, if there's a recognizable person, um, it needs consent for commercial uses. 
And sometimes you, when you have a very iconic building or outdoor art and public art, you could also potentially need releases and extra permissions depending on the context. Um, the first question you always ask is what type of speech? Is it commercial speech? Is it expressive? Is it editorial where the, the, the content is, is being used for a newsworthy purpose? Um, generally, you don't need releases for editorial uses and you don't need them when the photograph is the product itself, for example, a fine art print. Uh, so this, of course, you know, applies in the U.S. where we have a very robust First Amendment that allows publishers the, a lot of freedom to publish works of recognizable people and things for editorial purposes without any third party permissions, but that, that uh, does not apply equally if it's commercial speech, which only has limited protection. Next slide. Um, so how we define commercial speech, usually it proposes a commercial transaction. Um, and this is, I think, going to get muddier and muddier as a lot of of, you know, editorial websites try to, you know, monetize um, either content or advertisements and people, you know, think of creative ways for publishers to make money. Uh, this is a lot of this area I think is going to start getting grayer and grayer. So next slide. Um, so traditional editorial use is where you have some kind of video or image that enhances a story that is truth, truthful. Um, documentary, news broadcasts, articles, books. I mean, it doesn't have to be something that's like highbrow. It could be sports, it could be music, it could be entertainment, it could be culture. But there needs to be a relationship between the image and the content that's being discussed in an editorial manner. Um, I get questions all the time about covers. Covers can be commercial or they can still be editorial. It really depends on the context. So if you're doing a, a biography about a particular sports hero, you could have their face on the cover because the contents was about that person. But you could not put that same photograph on a book of fiction just to get people to buy the book more. And advertorial is not editorial which is why you have to have that little disclaimer on it. Um, so you, you can't, you know, disguise an advertisement as editorial and not worry about releases. Next slide. Have, have, you, come have across, you come across native, 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 uh, native uh, advertising? Um, there's, yes, and I think a lot, yeah, a lot of people are trying to do a lot of native advertising because they, you know, they're just looking for new ways of making money. Um, you know, in in the days of print, it was sort of easy because you could have separate your editorial people and your and your people who were getting advertisements, and you put them on separate pages. There was once a case because the cigarette ads looked a little bit like the articles, but it was okay because they came from different departments. So. Um, and, and when you're talking about right of privacy and publicity, again, you're, you're dealing with state law, and so they're not always uniform. I mean, the First Amendment is uniform, but you're going to have, you know, different uh, language. New York uh, only requires consent in writing if something's for advertising or trade. Many states like California will say you need written consent for something if it's commercial. These are the things that are not commercial, and they'll list like 1980s type of media, books, movies, film, plays. And I think there's, a, there's going to be a lot of, of content that kind of blend educational um, content with, with uh, new technology, um, virtual reality, games, videos, and that's where you're going to have muddy issues too. So next, next slide. Um, and you can be recognizable even if it's not just your face. So these are the types of, of um, triggers that have been someone's persona. 
considered persona. Next slide. Um, and I already did that. Next slide. So here I was saying astronauts. Um, I have gotten many claims of astronauts, particularly um, Buzz Aldrin. Um, the picture of the first man on the moon is not Neil Armstrong. It's Buzz Aldrin with his reflection in the visor. And he is very aggressive. Um, next slide. Silhouettes. You can sometimes recognize someone by the outline. Um, case in, in uh, California with a, uh, a pitcher, a, a particular pitcher who had a very unique stance and an illustrator did a silhouette for commercial use and claimed he was recognizable because everyone knew the way he put his knee up to throw. So you could be surprised sometimes. Um, and someone could have, you know, a very unique tattoo. I had a claim once of an image where there was no one's space. It was a painted guitar, but apparently this was a, a street musician in New Orleans, and his guitar had particular artwork on it, and that's how he knew himself. Next slide. Um, and just to remind you that there are exceptions for crowds, but you have to really understand what a crowd is. A crowd is where you barely can see any particular face and not just a group of five or six people. Um, and some states have specific exemptions that deal with crowds, so I just want to bring that up. Next slide. Um, this was a case where you can't see any people in these cars, but this one driver always was known for that white line that went around the red uh, car uh, and that stripe. So, um, you know, was able to bring a claim saying he was identifiable. Everyone knew that was him driving um, because of the stripe on the car. So when Winston put the picture on top, that violated his publicity rights in California. So, next slide. Um, another example of everyone's desire when they are a brand to retweet when the, a celebrity is seen shopping with their bags. Um, but, you know, it, you have to remember that the print rules still apply in the, on the online world. So you, Dwayne Reed could not post a picture of Katie Heigl carrying Dwayne Reed bags by saying, can't resist shopping here. That's considered, she considered that a commercial use of her identity as an endorsement for Dwayne Reed. Uh, it, of course, didn't go to trial. I believe um, a donation was made to a charity of her choice. But, you know, things that you think maybe no one would care about would just be fun or easy um, to do. Isn't it great that you saw so-and-so, you know, shopping at your store, reading your magazine? You have to really think twice about that. Next slide. Um, and again, also children, you you know, would need releases from parents. So uh, it's important if you want, you know, to ask people to upload photos to your um, Instagram account uh, wearing their products, you know, if you're going to, like, have kids in Crocs, you're going to have to make sure that you get parents' permission. And some states need writings. And, you know, if you just do a hashtag, is this okay? Do you really know if this is the person whose mom it is that you're talking to. So, you know, the questions you would ask in the sort of the analog world still get asked. It's just that things happen so quickly that I think sometimes people forget that they need to do a little homework. So next slide. Um, and then a little bit about objects that could be in pictures, and which is just a, a quick review that sometimes photographs have trademarks in them. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and, of course, trademarks are very different from copyrights, so any reproduction isn't necessarily a violation of trademark. It really is an unfair competition rule and deals with consumer confusion. And so the questions you ask about trademarks are different than copyright. Uh, next slide. Um, and you probably all know what a trademark is, but I thought I would just remind everyone here, it's really a source identifier, whether it's a word mark or device. Uh, symbol. Next slide. And trade dress is what often will uh, be the legal issue that could arise 
by an object in a photograph because the shape of something is so identifiable that when you see it, you know the source of goods. And, and some of them are very obvious. Um, these are the ones people talk about a lot, the Levi's, the, the spider, the Rubik's crew. Um, and next slide. So um, typically what happens is when someone recognizes their products or their iconic building, you'll just get a letter saying, you know, that's my product, that's my building, I didn't give you permission. But often the, the use may not be a trademark use at all and the image isn't being used as a source identifier. And so I have a whole stack of letters about, you know, why, why this photo is really not being used in a trademark way. Um, and only if it is that it really would be a violation by publishing a photo of the object. And I'll give some examples. Um, and you, you know, property releases are often used for uh, buildings and when they're being used for something commercial. Uh, again, it would not be necessary for editorial use where the image is being used just to illustrate uh, a newsworthy story. Um, and there's only certain buildings and architectural works that have really done what they need to do to be trademark protected. Um, but a lot of iconic buildings are just aggressive about their structure. Next slide. Next slide. Um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame sued a photographer for doing a, a poster years ago, claiming that they were a trademark. And the court said, well, no, you're really not using your building as a trademark because you're not using it consistently. A trademark needs to be used consistently in the same manner. And so when you look at a building, you can see it from many sides, many angles, close up, far away. And it's really a structure. So the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame would have had it used one facade of the building over and over for it to be a trademark use. So they said the building wasn't a trademark and also the poster wasn't a trademark use and it was fair use to identify the poster as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now Radio hey, City. Nancy, Nancy. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Sorry to sorry. interrupt. I, I think we're going to start to lose some people. But, um, okay. Yeah. I uh, think you know. I'm just done. I've got one more and uh, okay. all I, we're good. Uh, and just that for example, iconic buildings are trying to register now, like Radio City has filed a registration. Um, Guggenheim has been working to make that building a trademark. Flatiron, you might get a letter, um, but often it's just a geographic location. But these are examples of claims. Hollywood, I don't know if anyone really realizes that's the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce claims a trademark to that. I'm not sure it's really a trademark. Um, because it doesn't show many goods and services, but it's out there and you'll get letters. Uh, and then the last slide just shows that a skyline can never be a trademark because there's so many buildings, you would never think the Empire State Building or, this, or another significant building would be the source of any goods and services. It is just a skyline. But if you do a close-up, you will probably get a letter from the Empire State Building because they're very aggressive. And that sort of wraps up my um, just highlights of areas where I've seen issues. And, uh, you know, it, it sometimes it gets complicated because there's layers of intellectual property that can all be in one image. Um, but it's always important to look at the context. And I think having some good policies and, and using some good sources, and there's a lot of inexpensive ways of acquiring images legitimately where you can get all your indemnities. Um, many subscription services are offered. So sometimes free is never free. And well, thanks. questions? Any yeah. questions? Yeah, thanks so much, Nancy. Chris and I were, we weren't sure you can get through all that before I, 3 o'clock. That, that's I, amazing. I can whip through slides. <laughs> A lot of information. Uh, yeah, uh, do we do we have some questions out there? I was wondering, uh, do you have an email to follow up with? Uh, yes, it's um, n wolf with two s w o l f f mm -hmm. at c d a s dot com. Great, thank you. Yeah. Can we get a copy of these slides? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'll. 
I could send the link to some of those free, um, I've done free webinars for the, the Trade Association of Image Libraries. I've done one on when you need releases. I've done one on fair use. So that one, the audio didn't come out that well. And we have a few others on social media. We're trying to put more information up um, where um, about graffiti, about murals, things like that. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, post the, the, the slides and the recording. All right, and and uh, if you get a claim, I can help you get rid of them. <laughs> oh, I hope you don't, but it, it is it is frustrating. I mean, you even have a an owner of a photo library who wife retweeted a picture and got one of these claims, and you know, wanting thousands of dollars for an image that was up for a day. So, it, it, it this they're every they're coming out of the woodwork. Do you know, appreciate it. I, I've got a scoot, but thank you so okay. much. Do you, do you know, Nan Nancy, what I mentioned before? Um, so, so if if we're if a publisher is running a, a native ad fr from someone else, who's oh, responsible oh, for that? Responsible contract. Well, legally, anytime you publish something, you can have responsibility. But contractually, you always want whoever provides you with the ad to be the one responsible. Okay, and I also heard once that if you go in and, and edit any of it, then then it's on you, right? If you if you leave it as it is, okay, but then if you, you know, what oh, I mean, if you talking about well, what happened? I think what you might be referring to is user generated content. So if a user uploads something to your site, right, uh, then you can rely on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act if you're not heavily curating it. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to allow like offensive images on your website at all. Um, but it, what you would want to do is make sure you have a registered agent and a, a copyright uh, policy and an email that someone can put a complaint to. Um, and the registered agent would be at the copyright office. So that's for user-generated content where you would be immune from any monetary damages on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Okay. Thanks. Um... Uh, anything else uh, out there for Nancy? Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you do get sued, uh, what happens? Do you have to pay that uh, pay the settlement money, or can you just take down the image? Um, if you're sued and you don't have immunity under Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you have to defend yourself. Um, Maybe you look at where the source is, and that's why it's important to have that indemnity. So, for example, if the image came from sort of a trusted image source, they would stand behind it. If the image came because someone in your company just dragged and dropped it from Google, you would have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd want to find out if it's really the person who owns it. Do they have a registration? What would be the value of it? Uh, and generally, the damages they're asking for are going to be far more excessive than if you had licensed it because they have to pay the company that they hire to do the image search. They have to pay the lawyer. They have to pay, you know, there's so many people who want to be paid out of that tiny amount of money um, that they always start very high, which is why they stopped sending letters and start suing people because they knew they could leverage um, the cost of litigation and getting higher settlements. Wow. Thank you. And, yeah, now that I've ruined everyone's day. <laughs> in only an hour. In, under in, only, an hour. in, only, in under an hour. <laughs> it wasn't my intention. <laughs> okay, well, I think everyone knows also they can, uh, you know, can have your email now, or, or I would certainly forward anything to you okay. if, if that you. was easier for any follow-up questions. Right, any follow-up questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay. Well, this was great, though. Uh, uh, so thanks uh, for Chris and for Nancy, especially for taking the time with us You're today. Welcome. And uh, everyone, I'll, I'll be in touch with you soon. We'll schedule a next meeting in early in 2018. So Thank you. thanks. Great. All Thank right. you. Sure. Bye. Have a great uh, holiday. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.